there, you little gremlins. This week, we're talking monsters, from outcast to manifest destiny. Spooky. Stop doing that. Sorry. Well, let's get to it then, shall we? Welcome back to another episode of The Skybound Insider. Hello everyone, I'm Brian Mitchell. And I'm Cassie King, and welcome to the Skybound Insider, where each week we seek to bring you the ins and outs of everything that happens at Skybound in 15 minutes or less. Which is pretty hard because we do a lot of things here. Which is why, if you're a Skybound Insider, you can watch the full-length versions of our interviews and other adventures at skybound.com. Let's start this week off with some pretty great news, shall we? Yeah, last weekend, our friends at Walker Stalker Con in Chicago teamed up with Heroes and Villains Fan Fest for a joint convention, and many of you guys were there. The show featured some fan favorites the Walking Dead, Arrow, Gotham, Sons of Anarchy, and Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Cassie, who were those big studs? We're talking studs like Jeffrey Dean Morgan, Tom Payne, Michael Cudlitz, Lauren Cohen, Ming-Na Wen, and Ron Perlman, among many others. And if you didn't have time to go check it out, the next Walker Stalker Con hit San Francisco April 15th and 16th. Here's some of our favorite moments that our fans posted online. Montage, begin! If you missed it, last week we announced Kill the Minotaur by Chris Passetto and Christian Cantamesa with art by Lucas Kettner. The mythological epic comes out this June, so check out the trailer if you haven't yet. But before that, issue number one of Redneck comes out soon on April 19th. We'll be bringing you a full episode of this show on Redneck with Donny Cates the week after the series launches. Before then, we'd love to hear your thoughts on Redneck. So drop us a video review, letter, questions, thoughts, discussion, photo, Hedwig if you have her, to skyboundinsider at gmail.com. Ooh, spooky. I really hope this is not a permanent shtick. Totally will be. Speaking of spooky things. Which we really weren't even. We're talking Outcast. Season two of Outcast premieres internationally very, very soon. And your favorite Outcast podcast host, Clark Wolf, went to talk to the cast and crew last week. Roll it. It looks like everybody in this town is a demon. There's this revealing throughout the comics and the show of, oh, maybe it's just one person. And now I feel like we're kind of at a place where it feels like everybody is involved in this. It was always designed to be a show that escalates. So when you go from you know exorcism to exorcism in the first season, and it's case by case, the best place to go in the second season is to expand that. And that's why you know at the end of the first season, we get that sense that there's many more people who are possessed than we previously thought. And then exploring through the second season, we find out that more and more people in the town, I wouldn't say all of them, but a lot of people in Rome do seem to be on that side of things. And uh, I think it's really cool that we're boxing Kyle in to a certain extent. You but know, it we'll forces him to deal with it. Like in talking. In <laughs> Instead Don't of running me. off on his own, he has to evolve. Right. He has to take part in the thing. He's starting to realize he's going to have to play a bigger role, so he's going to need more information. And so through gathering that information, it sort of shapes his purpose or identity. Some of the more exciting stuff is him manipulating the rules and boundaries of this universe and his part in it. It's like, uh, you know, when they figure out in Jurassic Park that if you don't move, the T-Rex can't see you. It's like little loopholes like that that Kyle can start to exploit, start thinking a little more rather than just acting. Megan has worked very hard to build a life that's centered on her family and kind of like her general MO of being Mrs. Fix-It. Mm -hmm. So I guess I kind of always saw that as a bit of like a house of cards. And what I think the possession does is it so brilliantly has all of that crumbling to the ground. There's so much being thrown at every character. But you know, these are, these are a couple of very strong mm -hmm. women. Would you say that there are answers, some sort of answers? The revelation become 
a fast and furious, and it really is sort of, oh my gosh, that's what's going on here. But there are more questions as well. I mean, that's the beauty of the show in many respects. It's sort of it's like this tree, and it sort of is determined to take you down the wrong route, but thinks you're going down the right route. It's the Robert Kirkman way. Exactly. Right. So just when you think you're one step ahead, you suddenly find you're one step behind. If you could pick three words, to describe season two, what would you, each, three oh words Oh my each. gosh. Oh, we each. Each. that's six words. Six that's words six total. Words. Mm. Revenge. Mm -hmm. uh, Dystopian. Dystopian? Mm -hmm. No idea what it means, but no, it, sounds it sounds damn really good. good. It sounds very and, good. And um, I would say uh, microwave. Microwave. <laughs> <laughs> Unsettling. Mm -hmm. I like microwave. microwave. Microwave is a good one. It's, um, it's, it takes you, uh, like the show, in a different direction. Mm -hmm. Screwed up. That's another one. <laughs> That's a good one. Screwed, up. screwed. You take screwed, I'll take up. All right, screwed up. and up. Yeah. Lovely. Okay, but speaking of actual monsters, our comic Manifest Destiny hit a huge milestone recently with issue number 25. The comic continues telling the secret history of Lewis and Clark's foray into the western parts of North America, yet unexplored by Europeans. In honor of this achievement, we've put together the first of a few videos comparing the history versus the fiction. The video is on skybound.com exclusively for insiders this week before wide release. So go check it out. But for now, here's a sneak peek. The first volume of the comics takes place between May 23rd and around May 27th of 1804, and depicts the expedition traveling on river to find some kind of shelter at La Charette before continuing their westward journey. As a broad stroke, this first volume follows the real journey fairly accurately. Historically, the expedition began not long before then, as suggested by the book, on May 14th, 1804 at Captain River in Illinois. Clark led the men off in three boats, a 55-foot long keelboat and two pierogies of over 40 feet in length. One of them was painted red and the other painted white. While all three of those vessels can be seen depicted in the comic, the coloration does not match the historical accounts. The comic also keeps track of events and dates through Lewis's journal, but it's worth noting that various members of the crew actually kept journals, and that most of the information that we have about the time period actually comes from Clark's writing. From May 16th through May 20th, the expedition stayed situated in St. Charles, Missouri, which was a town of 450 people in 1803. Finally, on May 21st, Lewis rode overland from St. Louis to St. Charles and met up with Clark and the rest of the team. The expedition set out at 3 p.m. Now, I took to reading the journal of Clark and some of the other members of the expedition, and I can assure you that the biggest difference is that the exciting, adventurous, and thrilling account of these days in Manifest Destiny pales in comparison to how utterly mundane and boring reality actually is. While the comic's core discovery is fighting tooth and nail to keep civility, battling Buffalo Tour, reaching abandoned outposts, losing men to zombie-creating plants, and otherwise embarking on an enthralling, arch-filled mystery, the historical expedition... Uh, well... To celebrate issue number 25, I also got to sit down here in the studio with Chris Dingus, the writer of Manifest Destiny. Why don't we go check out what you guys had to talk about? Where did Manifest Destiny come from? I was getting drunk with friends on vacation, and I was uh, complaining about stuff like Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Hunter, and sex and sensibility and sea monsters. And I was uh, saying, you know, you could just take history and then jam fictional stuff in it and monsters. I was like, you could just say Lewis and Clark were actually killing monsters. And then I was like, wait. And the, the idea just sort of lent itself because at that time, the West of the Americas was sort of a big mystery. And Thomas Jefferson had seen, I think he'd seen like skeletons of a woolly mammoth and thought they may still exist. And if they exist, what else is out there? Right. And in modern times, there was a time where people's trust in the government was already, it was way, it was waning and beyond waning. <laughs> and it was like, you know, nobody believed anything. And it, for every news story, there was a conspiracy theory. Right. saying the opposite thing, and I was like, ah, oh, that can all sort of tie together. No, I think that there's a lot of inspiration there. Even if we're we're poking fun at like Pride, Prejudice, and Zombies, I think yeah. that like there's so much that comes to manifest yeah. like in that vein, in, in a really great way. And I hadn't even read it. Uh -huh. I was just I was bitching about just the thought of it, which is what assholes do. <laughs> and then I actually I watched the movie, and I, I thought it was really fun. How closely do you collaborate with Matt on monster designs? Usually I'll write a description and Matt will send something back and I'll be like that. It's, it's either exactly what I was thinking mm -hmm. or it's better. And it's actually a very short collaboration because usually whenever he draws and I look at him, I'm like, this is cool as hell. And even if it wasn't what I was thinking, I don't want to change it. I want to talk about Sacagawea. I think she's the backbone of the series, but how do you feel about that? She's the heart of the book. Yeah. Like when I was 
drunk and rambling about it, I was like, what if she was actually a badass warrior like Buffy? This was years ago, and that was sort of the touchstone for yeah. that kind of heroine. But I feel like there's a lot of other influences on her. I feel like there's like she's like also Clint Eastwood as the man with no name. Yeah. And there's a lot of different, there's, there's, a, there's millions of different things in mm -hmm. there. So what's up with Navath? Navath is a, is a horrible, terrible demon that's uh, licking his chops and waiting for uh, whoever survives to make it to the west coast. He's actually got a pretty nice place on the coast mm -hmm. with a hot tub. It's the past, so he's still playing vinyl. I think they had vinyl in 1804, yeah. right? Probably. Like, you know, he's not as bad as you think. They're probably just gonna chill with him. Well, we did it in about 15 minutes or less. Yeah, Skybounders. If you want to make sure that your questions get asked, make sure to follow Skybound on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, readskybound.com, and sign up for the Skybound Insiders program to get our newsletters in the digital mailbox. Psst. Insiders, check your email. We have a secret Facebook group, so go read the most recent newsletter for a link. Thanks so much for watching, and we will see you guys next week. Bye. Bye, guys. Goodbye. That was a pretty spooky episode. It was not spooky. Stop it, please. I thought it was pretty spooky. <laughs>